Okay. Well, good morning. Let me try that again. It is a pleasure to, uh, to be here to address you this morning and uh, talk to you about something that, uh, two subjects that I love to talk about, and that is um, life in space, because no matter where I go, people want to know what it's like to travel in space. The other is uh, entrepreneurship and business, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, I want to inter kind of share with you kind of my story. I have to, though, back up and uh, say that yesterday was wonderful. I was, uh, of course, participating in the uh, opening ceremonies, but more importantly than that, I'm sorry to say that, but more importantly than that, yesterday afternoon, uh, Valerie and I got a chance to speak to about 500 of uh, your local students here and had a wonderful time. And I have to tell you that if uh, the sample of students that we saw through their energy and through their knowledge is, is an example of uh, the expertise that you have here in the Kerala area, uh, you are in good hands because they were just wonderful. So a lot of folks ask me, uh, why did I decide to become an astronaut? Um, and it really started back in 1969 when I was 13 years old. I was fascinated with science and science fiction and um, one of the things that, that really struck me was when I was watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the moon. And uh, you remember those words, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind? Well, it was sort of a tremendous leap for this little boy to look at that little television, little black and white television, and decide that he wanted to follow in the footsteps of these great men. Now, to remind you, up until that time, we had only thought about traveling in space. Uh, we had gone through the Mercury program and the Gemini program and now the Apollo program and we were making these sort of baby steps. We were also in a uh, pretty fierce uh, race with the, with the Russians to see who would get to the moon first. And of course, uh, we made it. Now, I don't know, this is sort of a side story, I don't know if we have any space enthusiasts here, but the Russians almost beat us to the moon. And many people don't know this story. And uh, back, in, uh, back in the day, they had built the largest rocket. It was similar to the Proton rocket, the rocket in which they used, that they're using right now to do the heavy lifting, put up their Mir space station. And then also now they use parts of that for what we're doing with the International Space Station. But they were poised to almost beat us. And they had a catastrophic failure on liftoff which not only destroyed the rocket, but destroyed the entire complex. And if you ever get a chance to uh, go to Russia, they actually have a plaque in dedication to the, the many hundreds of lives that, that were lost. Now, Russians do something a little differently than, than we do. When we set up our rocket, we set up the rocket, and then the nearest people are about five miles away. In Russia, they set up the rocket, the rocket goes off, they lift it up, and people are just within about a half a mile. So they're really close, and in some cases, uh, less than uh, 100 meters or so. So from, from that um, uh, standpoint, it's kind of, they're, they're dramatically different, but if it wasn't for the accident, just as a side, uh, these pictures that you're seeing right now would, wouldn't have happened. Well, they probably would have happened, but not with the significance that they have today. But for a 13 years old, old boy to look at that and decide to full in, follow into these guys' footsteps was somewhat of a, of a leap of faith, and, and that was one that I, that I took. I, as you heard, uh, did the education, decided to become a, a medical doctor, uh, in part because of this slide here. I don't know if we have any Star Trek fans, but I was not only fascinated with science, but science fiction, as I mentioned before, and Star Trek was probably the leading uh, space uh, science fiction show of the day. And I like showing this slide because it shows uh, sort of the intro to my sort of business concept. Now, I don't know if you remember the show, but this is a picture of the doctor on the show named Bones. And Bones, when the crew would get sick, he would take them into a sit bay, he would put them into a bed, and the bed would automatically come up with the vital signs. So just above the, the, the bed was a display, and in that display would show blood pressure, you know, pulse rate, any arrhythmias and things like that, or even scan the body. I'm going to show you some technology in a few minutes that, uh, that brings that to reality. 
There were a few other things that that show brought to life. One was, I don't have it with me, but people have uh, smartphones now. Remember the, the saying from the captain, beam me up, Scotty? That handheld communications devices started with that show. Uh, if you uh, follow some of the other crew members, Ahura, who was one of the African-American uh, crew members on the show. Remember, this is in the 60s. This is when minorities were not, not really uh, in favor in, in those days. But she was walking around with what we now call an iPad, in which, uh, of course, the captain, captain signed. Uh, the PC, personal computer, actually was on that show. If you remember the screens and things like that in the background. And so it's kind of interesting to me how sometimes science fiction can predict science reality. But this is the real guy, Dr. Joe Kerwin, who was the first American physician to um, become an astronaut. And as a kid, I watched him. I, I watched him become a medical doctor, then become a flight surgeon, and then work at NASA. I watched him as he went on his first mission, spending 28 days on board Sky, Skylab. And he actually uh, took this picture when he was examining uh, one of his crew members. You notice something funny about this slide? It's a little bit different. So he's actually examining a, his patient in space. Of course, there's no gravity. And uh, he, if we were here on Earth, we would say, you know, uh, you know, Mrs. Johnson, please have a seat on the table. But of course, in space, we just say, hey, Joe, float this way, and it doesn't matter. There's, there's no up or down in space. I'll show you a slide. I think I have a slide in here later with my first physical examination uh, in space where it, uh, the lack of gravity really came to you know, hit me in the face when I went to grab one of my crew members because he was complaining of a cough and I wanted to take my stethoscope and put it on his chest and when I put it on his chest he went in the opposite direction. I realized right away that if I'm going to examine someone in space in a zero gravity environment, I first have to tie my patient down or have him hold on to something, and then I have to tie myself to my patient so that, you know, that equal and opposite reaction thing that we learn about in science does not, does not happen. So Joe Curran was my inspiration to lead me to, to NASA. As, as you heard, I've, I've flown two missions, traveled over 7.2 million miles, and it was uh, just an incredible um, experience to be an, an astronaut and to train as an astronaut. Uh, when we first come into the astronaut corps, we go into a training program that lasts about two years, and in that two years we learn how to fly jets, learn how to fly the shuttle, we learn how to survive in different types of environments, uh, in the water and, and the uh, and the oceans and, and, and the uh, winter survival we do out in Siberia. And so it's a lot, of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of training that goes on. Even get a chance to do something that I really didn't appreciate, and that is jump out of perfectly good aircraft. So we actually did parachute training, which was neat. And so I jumped uh, out uh, on land and jumped out on water in preparation for that. Now, once you go through that basic training, we uh, actually get together as a crew and we get selected for a particular mission. And when we get together as crew, we, we design the insignia for the, the mission that we're about to fly. And what you see on this slide right now is our patch for that mission. And whenever you see astronauts and we're in our flight suits and garb, you actually see a patch that will be on our coat or on our flight suit that signifies the mission. And so this is a patch for my second mission where we went to the Russian space station. So you'll see the depiction of the Russian uh, space station down at the bottom and the first time the shuttle had gone to the station. So you'll see the depiction of the, the shuttle there. You'll see that it was a joint mission between the Americans and the Russians. So you'll see the, the American and Russian flag there. And then every mission has a mission number. And so there is a mission number and our mission number for this flight was 63 embedded in this patch. And that's symbolized by the six rays of the sun that you see coming off the, the limb of the earth there, and three stars. But you know, that's all well and good. All that big explanation I, I told you, all well and good. You know the most important thing about this patch is, is that it has my name on it, if you look right there to the, to the left there. So we want to make sure that we have uh, evidence to show all our family and friends that we indeed uh, uh, went into space. So let's go into space. As you've heard, I flew on Columbia for my first mission, Discovery, and my second. This is the Discovery mission. 
The shuttle is an, a fascinating vehicle. It weighs about five million pounds. It takes about uh, seven and a half million pounds of thrust out of five engines to get us off the ground. And I'm here to tell you this morning that when those engines light, you are leaving this planet. Nothing is going to hold you to it. As a force hits the ground, we go in the opposite direction in a hurry. So fast that by the time we clear the launch tower, we're going faster than the speed of sound, 750 miles per hour. And at that point, if you are invited to see a launch, what you, uh, the, the closest you can be, it's about five miles away. So at five miles away, you'll see the shuttle take off. You'll see it, uh, but you won't hear it. About 14 seconds later, the ground begins to shake, and then another two seconds, you actually get the noise that, that hits your body. And it hits your body as not just the noise, but is actually a physical uh, response. Remember I said we went through the sound barrier. Well, when you go through a sound barrier, you produce a sonic boom, and that sonic boom hits the ground and then begins to you know, permeate and extend out, and it takes about 14 seconds, 16 seconds uh, all to, to get you there. And so it's kind of interesting. I, my uh, best friend who I went to medical school with um, was at the launch, and he was watching uh, the launch, and he said it was really beautiful to see you lift off and feel that force and power, and he said it was so emotional that it reminded me of the birth of my first child, his first son. And I said, well, if you thought it was emotional as your first child being five miles away, you should have been in the sh shuttle. You should have been in the vehicle. I'll show you what emotion is. When that thing is lighting, we're screaming like banshees. What can I say? No, I'm just playing. It does get your attention, though, when you're sitting in the vehicle being pushed back in your seat to at niche initially two times your weight, uh, kind of forced to the, to the back of the seat. It's extremely loud. It's a lot of vibration that occurs in every direction as that you could imagine as you get catapulted in space. We are going so fast that within two minutes, we reach an altitude of 100,000 feet. So that's about three times high as most aircraft fly. At that point, we drop off the solid rocket motors, as you see here, and those fall back to the Earth and are recovered. And now we're above most of the atmosphere. When we're above most of the atmosphere, we can now speed up. So now, at this point, we're going a mere 2,500 miles an hour. And over the course of the next six and a half minutes, we'll go from 2,500 miles an hour to 5,000, 15,000, eventually to 17,000 miles per hour. At 17,000 miles per hour, we go from being pushed back in our seat to three times our weight to zero gravity, just like that. And in that moment, it was wonderful to get out of my seat and to look out the window and see this view. And this is one of my favorite views. You want to know why? Because it shows the orientation of, of the shuttle that we fly to the Earth. We usually fly upside down. And we have our windows overhead so we can look down at the Earth very, very easily. The other reason I like this is that it shows the cargo bay, the laboratory in which we will do our experiments in. You kind of see that up at the top. You also see the robotic arm. But more importantly than that, you can see the limb of the Earth. And you see that it's round. So I love this slide for all you Flat Earth Society members who are still out there. The Earth is indeed round, and I got a chance to see it with my own eyes. Let me introduce you to my crew. So this is a crew from my second flight. I also want to introduce the, the type of suits that we uh, use up there. The suits down below, the orange suits, are our launch and entry suits. Those suits are just used to go into space and come from space. They weigh about 120 pounds. The suits at the top are our EVA suits, or extravehicular activity suits. Those suits weigh 350 pounds. And so you're probably wondering how we could take this slide, because this slide, of course, is take, taken on Earth. Well, in real, uh, the, the reason we can take this slide is because even though you see six people in this slide, there are really 10 people in this slide, because there are two suit technicians in the back holding me up and two holding the other, other guy up. It is no way that we can wear this suit here on Earth without some help. And normally when we're doing our spacewalks, spacewalk training, we will get in the suit, 
on an apparatus that holds the suit up. And once we get in the suit, there is a crane that picks us up and will put us in our teaching modality, which is, our, which is called the neutral buoyancy facility. It's a big pool in which we can sink uh, large pieces of the shuttle or the station and actually practice putting those things together. And why water? Because the suit is filled with air. And it's actually the same suit that we use in space can be used underwater. It's a pressure suit. And because it's filled with air, it tends to float. And so once they put us in the water, they actually add additional weights to our suit in order to weigh us down so that we can go in and underwater, not all the way down to the bottom, but somewhere in the middle. And that's why we call it the neutral buoyancy facility. So we do a lot of practice there. Now I want you to take a close look at our, our crew here. I want you to take a look at the young lady that's right below me. Her name is Eileen Collins. Eileen Collins is uh, one of my favorite people. We were in the same astronaut class together. Uh, she uh, was the first female pilot who later became the first female commander of a space mission, in this particular shuttle, shuttle mission. She, he or she was a pilot for the shuttle. And I want you to look at all of our faces, and I want you to look at her hair as we now go into space. So as we go into space, we all get puffy eyes and puffy cheeks, and she gets an instant afro. You see that? Now, I don't know how many people have seen um, Gravity. Has anybody seen the movie Gravity? OK, a number of folks in there. You probably heard uh, a lot of astronauts that have come out the sense of gravity and said, oh, you know, poo-pooed it and say, you know, there are a lot of mistakes and that sort of thing. I have to tell you that I, I enjoyed the movie. But there were a couple of things that, was, uh, that bothered me a little bit. I don't know if you remember Sandra Bullock had short hair like Eileen Collins. And, and uh, during the entire movie, no matter whether she was in space or whether she was in the spaceship or in the space station, her hair was perfect. That would not happen uh, in space. She would be wearing an afro, you know. And the other thing, and I hate to ruin it for the others, but I'm going to show you just one other thing. Now, when she got out of her spacesuit, she immediately, you know, when she was safe, you guys remember this? And she got into the space station, she immediately got out of her spacesuit, and then all of a sudden she was dressed in shorts with a nice top looking all sexy and stuff like that, and everybody went, all the guys went, whoa, right? That would never happen. <laughs> First of all, her hair would be standing on end as she's been crazy about, you know, almost being killed. Uh, but secondly, if we put on the spacesuit, we actually wear a liquid cool garment. So it's like long johns, long uh, underwear that have uh, tubes that run through it. And through those tubes, we run water in order to cool our body because we're in a, sp a place that has uh, no oxygen, it's a vacuum. So there's no way in which to get rid of the heat unless you use this equipment. So she would actually be in another garment, but she wouldn't look as sexy. So what can I say? <laughs> The fluid shift or, or the uh, puffiness of the face that I described really comes from a fluid shift that occurs. As you're sitting right here, you have about one-fifth of your blood volume in your lower legs, held down there by gravity. When you go into space, that one-fifth of the volume moves up toward your head, goes into the tissues of your face, and makes your face look puffy, makes your eyes look a lot smaller. If you ask astronauts how we feel, we'll tell you that we have a slight headache, and that comes from increased pressure on, on the brain from this fluid shift. The fluid also gets into our nasal passages, and we feel like we have a head cold during the time. We don't think quite as clearly. You might have also heard that astronauts, when we go into space, actually will grow an inch or two, and that is true. And the reason is because our body is unloaded, so we no longer have the weight of the body carried on our spine. And that extra water goes into the tissues of the discs between the vertebral bodies and stretches our spine. So we actually do grow one to two inches. So if you're vertically challenged, become an astronaut. So my job as, a, as the crew medical officer, the astronaut on board, is to take care of, of medical issues that, that happen in space. And uh, we've learned a lot about the body. Uh, during my introduction, there was uh, a mention of disuse osteo osteoporosis. And what that is, is that when we go into space, we lose about 1% of bone per month up there. And so far, the longest um, stent that folks have spent in space have been the Russians who spent 422 days. And we 
uh, up to that point have not seen any decrease in that rate of loss, of bone loss. So it looks like this may be one of the uh, long poles in the tent when it comes to long duration space flight that we're going to have to deal with. We all lo also lose about 15 to 20 percent of our muscle mass up there, both in our legs and our arms, because we don't need them to walk around with. Uh, we use our arms to um, move around by pulling ourselves along. If I want to go from that side of the room to that side of the room, I just press my little finger and I go gliding right across. It's not a, not, you know, doesn't require a lot of effort. And in fact, it's like putting your entire body in a cast. And, and think about that, anybody who's broken their arm. When you take that cast off, what does it look like? And that's what we look like from a total body standpoint when we come back uh, from Earth. So my job is to figure out which part of that is good adaptation, meaning the body's ability to adapt to that environment, and which one's bad, and to develop countermeasures, what we call them, against that, which has resulted in a lot of uh, advances along the way, which I'll talk about in just a minute. I mentioned that this mission went to the Mir Space Station. This is a picture of the Mir Station. So that's the Earth there to the uh, left, and then you can see the sun rising behind the station. I have to tell you, it was beautiful. This was probably about 100 miles away as we were beginning to do our approach toward the, toward the station. And when the sun was shining behind it, and you can't see it in this slide, it, uh, the sun was shining through the solar panel, so it made it look like it was made out of gold. It was just the most beautiful sight that, I, that I'd ever seen. Now remember, uh, we're traveling about 17,500 miles an hour in this, uh, trying to catch up with it. As we got closer, this is the view. We flew on top of the space station, and then we were looking down, so you can see the Earth down below it. Now, this looks pretty small but it's about the size of a football field, if you include all the solar panels and the uh, radiators that are there. There's a closer up view of the doctor who was on board, Dr. Polinikov, who actually was the human being who spent the most time in space, that 422 two days uh, in orbit. So I just happened to take this picture just as he was uh, looking out the window as we were doing our, our close approach, but you can see uh, how big that vehicle is. So where his head is, and if you look at the diameter of that module, it's about 25 feet or so, and the length is about 40 feet. So it's a pretty big, big module that at that time had been up for over, over 11 years. Let me show you um, a couple of views from, from space, looking down at the Earth. One of the things, as, as an astronaut, I think we get um, impressed by is being up above the atmosphere, we have just these unobstructed views of the Earth that we, of course, want to share. We have also uh, are big advocates of uh, saving the planet because of the things that we have seen uh, through the years. This is a, a view of Egypt. This is the White Nile below and the Blue Nile, and you can see in between this normally would be desert, but over the years they have taken the water out of uh, both the rivers and they have irrigated. So you can see that it's kind of green in, in the middle there. So you can actually see this from space. Here's a dust storm. So early on in, when we were, we were flying in uh, on board Apollo and then in the early shuttle, we began to take pictures of the Sahara Desert. As we took pictures of the Sahara Desert, we noticed that every year it was getting bigger and bigger. And uh, one of these pictures is, is this one here where we're showing a dust storm. And as the Sahara Desert gets bigger and more dust gets lifted up into the air, it's actually changing our planet. How is it doing that? This dust will be lifted up to about 50,000 feet and carry it completely over the Atlantic Ocean and will dump over here in the, uh, in the, or dump in the Americas. And that dust also travels around, uh, tra travels around the world. On my first mission, we got a chance to see a volcanic eruption as it occurs. And it was amazing, as at 17,500 miles an hour, we go around the world every 90 minutes. So we saw the eruption, and by the time we came back around, we could see the plume had moved thousands of miles and was, had spread over the entire South American uh, continent and was heading over the Pacific Ocean. And that dust eventually ended up uh, over in Europe. Here's a nice view of, uh, of the Earth 
and what we call the terminator. So this is where daytime and nighttime occur at the same time. Of course, the only way that you can see that is from space. So you can see nighttime there to the right and daytime there uh, to the left. And that's Africa. You can see Spain and uh, England and up the European coast. This is a standing wave called the Suloi that's uh, in the uh, Indian Ocean. So this is where you actually have cold water coming together with warm water and end up producing a standing wave in the middle of the ocean. And these waves will be in, in excess of um, 12 to 15 feet. Sometimes small boats can't uh, actually cross them, so only the, the large tankers can get past these things. But it's, it's like being on the beach you know, where the waves kind of roll in. So this wave is just rolling in on itself in the middle of the ocean. You can see how large that is. That's probably about a, a 50 mile long wave there. I thought I would throw in some photos of India since we're here. So this is India uh, from uh, at night. And so you can kind of see all the, the major cities there. In fact, the, the in, entire uh, country there, which I think is pretty, pretty cool. How about this view? And this is a view of Mumbai. So this is what a city looks like from, from space. So a lot of folks ask, because they've heard this, uh, you know, what, is, what do cities look like? Well, at night, you can see them very clearly, of course, because of the, because of the lights. During the day, the only thing you can see is uh, just sort of gray patches. In this case, it's kind of tinted blue. So this is a, the major, this is where the buildings and concrete and road infrastructure, you can't see individual roads, but you can, of course, uh, kind of get a feel for, uh, for, for the city. The only man-made structure that you can see from space is the Great Wall of China. And the only time that you can see that is during certain times of day when the sun is, uh, is either rising or setting over China, and it causes a long shadow. Because if you've ever been to China, the Great Wall, the wall is actually on the tops of the hills and the, and the mountains, so it accentuates that. Here's another view that I thought was kind of neat. Now this is taken from the space station. Let me kind of orient you. And this shows a couple things which I think is kind of neat. So you can kind of see the cities there. On the right of this slide is one of the solar panels from the International Space Station. So you can tell that it's been taken from the International Station. And I think it's cool. You can kind of see the colors and it's almost done almost like in time-like uh, photography. But you notice the, uh, that layer of air which looks like a, a shield over the Earth. So at nighttime, we actually see this. You can see this with your eyes. And what this is, that is actually the atmosphere. You can see where the atmosphere is ending. And what happens during the day when the sun is shining on, on our atmosphere, it energizes the particles. And so that when the sun goes on the other side of the earth, or we travel on the other side of the earth, what you see is that leftover energy is captured inside the atmosphere. And this is one of the, the nicest slides that I can show of that. So if you were in space, you can actually not only see it, but you can actually feel the difference or measure the difference in the heat that gets immediate, uh, uh, emanated from, from this layer of atmosphere. It's kind of cool. That's why we can survive on Earth. And that's why if you go to Mars, which has no atmosphere, you would not see this at all. So let's go back to me being a medical doctor and a crew medical officer, because now I want to transition to uh, why I got involved in entrepreneurship, particularly in, in healthcare. And it's because of my experience as a, as a crew medical officer. Uh, we do thousands of or hundreds of experiments. If you look at uh, what astronauts do collectively on board the space station and also the space shuttle, on, on my first mission, we did 91 different investigations. On my second mission, we did around 40 investigations. A lot of those in, involved uh, healthcare and medicine. I've already alluded to some of the things that, that happened to you. So when we are trying to ensure human survival, we have an opportunity to, to learn, learn a lot. Here's a view of me examining one of our crew members, one of the first physical examinations that, that was done in space. And following this examination, we also did the first telemedicine conference from space. Now, when we find medical issues up there, we are backed up 
not only by uh, crew members or, or physicians here on Earth, we call them flight surgeons, but we carry a, a myriad of different types of equipment, medical equipment, in order to diagnose, uh, analyze, collect the data, and send it back down to the Earth. And we call that telemedicine. And actually, telemedicine got its start uh, at NASA over 50 years ago when we first started monitoring uh, human beings going into space. And so when I joined the astronaut corps, I really took that to heart and began to look at how we could develop this type of diagnostic equipment, and then what would we do uh, to take care of crew members from a long distance uh, called remote medicine. Because of our involvement over the last few years, of course, NASA has uh, developed a lot of different technologies. And I know this is an eye chart, but in here it talks about that we created the robotic surgery, that we, we were involved in uh, moving uh, imaging uh, forward, that we developed the uh, third arm for surgeons uh, to uh, have robotic assistance, that we developed portable x-rays and, and other imaging devices, and lastly, which I think is really important in the early program, is that we were involved in the development, the early stage of the pro programmable pacemaker. And the results of that have not only helped astronauts survive in space, but it's helped us here on Earth. This is a picture of that, of that first robotic arm, that third arm, that was used to hold uh, different types of medical devices but also to uh, help with imaging for, for people doing laparoscopic surgery. I wanted to show you this. I found this the other day. I don't know if you heard that, that uh, we actually have a robot that assists us when we're doing our spacewalks called Robonaut. And this is Robonaut 2. And Robonaut 2 uh, actually helps us when we're out doing our spacewalk. If uh, we lose a tool, the robot's actually able to fly and get the tool for us uh, because normally we're tethered when we're doing spacewalks. And the anticipation is as this gets more um, usable, uh, perhaps it will be Robonaut that will end up going to Mars and making that, that first vision. Okay. So I mentioned to you that uh, we travel around 17,500 miles an hour, which means we go around the world every 90 minutes, and we get to see a sunset or sunrise every 45 minutes. And I want to show you what a sunrise from space looks like. So first of all, let's see, Earth. It's uh, down below. You can see the clouds at about 50,000 feet, and then you can see different layers of the atmosphere. And so this is a sunrise in real time. And so the sun will come up, and within a matter of about five seconds, will be full bloom in your face. And the temperature will go from a minus 165 degrees to 200 degrees Fahrenheit within 10 minutes of this whole process. So when we think about you know, life in space, and particularly uh, spacewalks, all our equipment have to be able to resist those extreme temperatures when, when, we're, when we're up in space. So this was a nice transition to uh, talk about what I do now as an entrepreneur. I left NASA about 15 years ago to uh, pursue a dream that I had that started when I was in college to uh, explore being an entrepreneur. And it was actually prompted by a, a, uh, one of my professors at the University of Houston when he poised a question uh, for us. And I have to remind you, this is in the 70s when we were trying to uh, you know, deal with issues around race in the United States. And we got into this discussion in our class, and this was a black economics class, about whether uh, communities advance or economic prosperity. How is economic prosperity? Is it dependent? on black and white, you know, is it a black and white issue? That was sort of the question, and we got into this massive debate. And at the very end, the professor uh, said, after some of us lined up that, yeah, it's a black issue, yes, it's a white issue, the whites command all the power and all that sort of thing. And then he basically set us all straight by saying this, that it's not economic prosperity and growth and nation, no matter where you are, it's not a black and white issue, it's a green issue. It is who holds the money. It is a goal issue. You know, the golden rule, he who holds the gold makes the rules, that type of thing. And that stuck in my head. So much so that when I was done with, with NASA, I said, okay, what next? And the what next for me was this, this notion of exploring of how can I get more of that gold? 
how could I participate in the economic prosperity of the United States and, and, and the world? And of course, it meant that I had to learn a little bit more about business. So I went back to the University of Houston, got an MBA. I started working uh, for a, a small startup uh, called Space Hab, and then eventually ended up working for Vanguard Ventures, a venture capital firm, and got introduced to the concept of venture capital. And of course, I would not focus in any area that I didn't know about, and what I knew about was telemedicine. So I formed Vesalius Ventures in 2002 to focus on investing in the area of telemedicine. I want to spend the next few minutes talking about that. So these are some of our, some of our portfolio companies, which I'll share with you in just a minute. But what we try to do is look at companies that are in the intersection of these three areas, medical devices, healthcare IT, and telecommunications, and which, uh, you know, with the advances in technology that has occurred over the last few years in broadband and technology and some of the technology that we got from, from NASA, uh, being able to do things like virtual house calls is, is now for real. Uh, using medical devices or using uh, smartphones as medical devices and now become real. Uh, and so this convergence of technology is what we look for in the company. The other thing that has helped our business over the last couple of years is what you've probably heard in the United States is healthcare reform. And uh, I won't go into healthcare reform, simply say that it has uh, created an environment from an investor standpoint in the area of telemedicine that has been really good for us. Because the only way that you'll be able to do all the things that the Affordable Care Act uh, is asking for, uh, meaningful use in healthcare 2.0, is using technology. And so even though I've you know, been involved with Vesalius over 2002, it's just been within the last four years that it's really taken off. I wanted to show this slide, so why? This is, um, I don't know if you've, uh, some of you from, uh, that have been to the United States in Houston, we have a very large system called Herman Memorial. It's the largest healthcare system out there. And the guy who runs that, that group is a friend of mine, Dan Wolderman. And Dan had this slide, and I took it from him, showing the, the change that's occurring in, in healthcare in the United States. On the left side, is the traditional way in which we have practiced for fee for service, desperate systems. We focus mainly on uh, illness and, and cure. And all of that is a very expensive way in which to provide health care. So, and it uses traditional technology, the imaging technology, which actually adds more cost to health care. The new model, though, is going to involve fixed payment, bundled payment system. It's going to be dealing with population health, preventive health care. Again, the only way that can be done is u utilizing innovative technology, an integrative healthcare system. And so this has really been a, been a watershed for, for us. So this idea of telemedicine really is not a new one. And I just showed a couple of slides. I wanted to show this slide that shows a, a couple of uh, uh, advertisements and cartoons that date way back into the 20s when radio was the big thing. That was the latest and greatest technology. There were visionaries that thought that radio and those, uh, radio could be used to provide telemedicine. And then there were folks that thought telephones could be used. And then later on when television came about, then uh, you can kind of see that, that evolution. Uh, the interesting one right there in the middle, you see this says auto dock. You know, remember the day when we would never trust an ATM? And now we're, we, uh, there's no, you know, there's no issue with uh, going and, and using automation to, to draw out money. The same thing is going to happen in, in healthcare. So let's talk in the last few minutes just a little bit about what we've seen. And then at the same time, I'm going to show you some of the investments that we've made. So in healthcare, we see that there is going to be a lot of movement in managing care, man disease management, managing people at the home. And so these are several devices that sit in the home that actually are used for disease management. They can manage diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, uh, just by uh, acquiring uh, data from the patients, blood pressure, glucometer, from you know, portable devices that they might, that they might wear that get uh, uploaded to these devices and then sent to a call center 
and then a decision made to treat them or not or bring them into, into the hospital. One of our earliest investments was a company right there in the middle and it was called Health Hero. And uh, we actually sold that to Botch about uh, five, five years ago. Another area is smartphones. I've kind of already mentioned this a little bit. So smartphones have allowed us to have a mobile platform in which we again can use these devices to pick up uh, physiological data from devices in which patients wear. And then again, be able to have onboard analysis in your smartphone, be able to send that to uh, a call center or to your physician, or in the case of uh, kids who suffer from juvenile diabetes, be able to send their blood sugars directly to their parents. So, uh, so in addition to uh, getting immediate, immediate uh, feedback and care, the parents can keep up with whether the kids are, are doing, you know, doing their finger sticks and taking their, their insulin as necessary. One of our companies here is a company called EOS Health, which actually is involved in diabetes. There is a, a lot to do with patient remote monitoring. And I, I showed in the introductory slide of the SALE is a, a company called uh, Sensiotech. And I also put the slide uh, from Star Trek there. So we actually have a company that we invested in that uses ultra-wideband radar and what ultra-wideband radar is, is the technology in which the military used to look inside of buildings. Now, you've probably seen the movies where, you know, you have the SWAT team or the military on the outside and they want to go into the building, uh, but they don't know who's in there. And so they use a device to actually look inside the building. It's a radar. And so this technology now has been declassified, and of course, it's... The, the radar for looking inside the building is much higher. The energy is much higher than what we use for. In fact, the energy that we use is about one-tenth of the energy from a cell phone. But it's enough energy to send a radar wave into the body, be able to look at the return, and be able to count beats, be able to look for arrhythmias, and be able to look at respiratory rate. And eventually, we think, be able to get blood pressure. So this is another one of those science fiction technologies that have become, uh, come into reality. Another uh, um, company that's mentioned on this slide is Monibo, two of them, Monibo and, and uh, eCardio. Um, eCardio is the third largest uh, cardiovascular monitoring company, and one of our technologies, Monibo Technologies, which is an algorithm that actually analyzes the cardiac wave is actually embedded into eCardio. So we are pretty excited about that. And then uh, one of my most recent investments has been in, in uh, doctors providing monitoring using uh, the internet or using two-way communications. And one of the examples here is uh, our company called JSA Health, which does telepsychiatry. Now, think about that. In the old days, you used to be able, used to have to go to a doctor's office, sit on a couch, and actually have psychiatric consultation, and now we can do it using technology. So technology is involved in a lot of different things. Robotics, uh, allowing for uh, doctors to go into uh, visits in the hospital without being there. Robotic surgery, you're probably very familiar with. Again, all of this technology is uh, changing, the, changing the face of medicine. So I'm running out of time, and I'm going to leave with about four slides that I want to cover to address this question. And by the way, is this a nice slide? Anybody know what this is? Aurora. Yep, exactly. So it is Northern Lights. Um, and uh, I had lived in Minnesota, trained at the, at the Mayo Clinic, and so we're up in high inclination. So I got a chance to see uh, Northern Lights uh, from the ground. It was just beautiful, uh, and it was shocking because I didn't realize, uh, you know, that this could happen. But think about this. On my second mission, we were a high inclination orbit, and one night I was uh, on the flight deck, and I noticed these lights in the distance. And first of all, I thought it might could, could have been a UFO. You know, everybody asked me about UFOs. It wasn't a UFO. What it was was the beginning of Northern Lights. So I was coming off the coast of... Um, of uh, Japan heading over the northern uh, Pacific and you could see this, these lights in the distance and as we got closer 
it just began to fill the entire window of the space shuttle. It was beautiful. And we flew right through these northern lights, which was just, just incredible. You can't, you can't do that living on Earth, what can I say? So I'm going to end with this question. And it's a question that I'm going to give at least my answer to. And that is, what does it take to be an entrepreneur? And I think the first is to view the world differently. And I think all of you guys could probably agree with that, right? I think we all view the world differently. We see things that other people don't see. You know, there may be uh, a technology that's commonly used and people think that it can't be improved and somehow we as entrepreneurs look at that and see an opportunity. So an entrepreneur views the world differently. What else? We explore new ways of doing that business. So we see the opportunity, we see the technology, and we're not afraid to look for new ways in which to uh, either bring a new technology or new service. Uh, and you have to be able to do that. Next, we take risk. And I think it's been said uh, many times here is that uh, we are risk takers. And if you're not a risk taker, you probably shouldn't be an entrepreneur. Now, when I transitioned from uh, NASA into um, venture capital, I actually got a call from Venture Magazine, which is our big venture paper. And they said, well, how do, you know, why would an astronaut, a physician, decide to become uh, an entrepreneur, particularly in venture capital? And I said to her, it's all about risk. I've been used to taking risks all my life. And it was natural for me to now be involved in venture capital, where we take risks every day. In. And especially when you, when you look at our numbers, you know, a typical, uh, typical investments, if we invest in uh, 20 companies, the majority of them are going to fail. And we're going to, as it's been said, I think I saw the video, you learn a whole hell of a lot through your failure, which allow you to apply that knowledge to, to your successes. And fortunately in our business, when we have a success, it's a real big success and it makes up for all of those failures. So don't be afraid to take a risk. And then when you are putting together these, uh, your technologies and your innovation and you're coming up with these new, eyes, new ideas, remember that you cannot do it alone. Sometimes you have to stand alone to get it started, but in order to have it done, you really have to work as a team. You have to build the right team. And as a venture capitalist, we don't invest not necessarily, not only in the technology, we invest in the management. We invest in the management team. So make sure that you build the appropriate team with the appropriate level of expertise. If you do all of that, then I think that the rewards are great. So I wanted to share with you today kind of why I got involved in, in um, being a physician, flying in space, how I made that transition from being an astronaut to now being an entrepreneur and particularly uh, a venture capitalist. And, and I hope in doing so that I've inspired those of you who are young entrepreneurs. And by the way, let me define young entrepreneurs. Uh, young entrepreneurs can be 20 years old or they can be 60 years old, but they're young in heart. They have this, this drive that says that I can change the world. So I'm speaking to, to you. And so I hope that my presentation has given you some additional fuel to go out and change the world in your own way. Thank you so much for listening. Okay. Wasn't it wonderful, guys? <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, doctor. Uh, it was amazing, um, you know, to, to see your journey and, you know, what, what it takes. I mean, I think, and your concluding remarks on, on what it, uh, you know, what is what is that makes an entrepreneur successful like an astronaut? I think uh, um, <clears throat> one, of, one of the things I was thinking is that, uh, you know, in a way both are entrepreneur and an astronaut are, are on a mission with a sort of like a leap of faith. You have to do a lot of hard work, a lot of training to get there, but uh, basically it's also a leap of faith, right? And, and, and you have to believe in yourself, you yeah. know, so. Uh, that that I noted. You talked about the taking uh, risk. Um, 
Also, I, one of the things we were talking earlier is that uh, in, in both in an entrepreneur's case as well as uh, an astronaut, uh, you know, if one wrong mistake can, you know, really make you fall down and you have to, you have to get up and move again, but, you know, one could be fatal. <laughs> but business also could be, you know, fatal. So, uh, and many times you don't have a lot of time to, to make a decision, not a lot of analysis, so you have to kind of, you know, make a right judgment call, right? Uh, you do, so, you do. Yeah. yeah, a perfect example of that is uh, my first mission, <coughs> um, we lost an engine right before liftoff. And in, in doing, doing that, I, I had a choice. I remember it was a really bad day. Hmm. Um, you can imagine, you know, being, and I described what the liftoff was, and uh, having all of that force and that power and the engines turn on, and you think that, you know, after all these years of training, that you're gonna get a chance to go into space, and all of a sudden, you have a failure, and you're still on the ground. And uh, so you have a choice there. At NASA, we had a choice. Do we stay on the ground or do we fix the problem, learn from the problem, and then launch uh, another day? And that's exactly, what, that's exactly what we did. And to your point, of course, the only way we survived it is that we had trained, we had studied, uh, and we reacted. And we reacted based on our experience and our training and our knowledge in, it, in order for us to survive that incident so that we can live to, uh, to uh, be successful another day. Thanks. We have a c time for a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Yeah. Uh, Harris, uh, the last comment you made was very encouraging because you defined young entrepreneur as somebody at 20 as well as 60. <laughs> so many of us in the older age group gives us more confidence. The question I had is uh, we have a lot of youngsters as well as uh, people in older age group. Can you explain or narrate one incident in your astronautic life which was some kind of a catastrophe and how did you move out of that? You just now told about an engine failure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, something of that nature because today's world is changing. We have uncertainty, discontinuity, whatever you call volatility, and we are all faced with that, the kind of turbulence uh, the business world faces. So some experience from you will be very useful to us. So um, I mentioned about the astronaut failure. Let me talk, talk to you about one of my first failures as, as an um, entrepreneur, as a venture capitalist. Uh, I had uh, pulled together the Salius in 2002 by pulling together a, a partnership of venture capital firms, very top-notch firms, Vanguard Ventures, Seven Rosen, uh, some of these um, uh, may, you may know, uh, both of those had um, you know, assets under management of at least two billion. Boston Scientific was part of that group and I found this young man in and I'm, I'm going to say the city, I found this group, I'm not going to name any names here, that had a great technology that we thought was going to change the world. I, I had worked with the team for three to four months. Uh, we had helped them with their business plan because we we're also an accelerator. And then we presented it to our investors. We got the investors buy-in. We had $5 million uh, already committed. And the entrepreneur decided that he wanted a better deal. So he went to, after we had struck the deal, he went to another group and said, well, you know what, I don't really want to deal with these groups. I have this money, so you know, can I get some more money from you? You guys have probably heard that story, right? And so when it got out that this had happened, it destroyed the deal. And I was, it was my first deal very limited experience in, in venture capital. And so I had to go back to my original investors and advise that we not proceed with this guy. Why? Because he was not trustworthy. And a lesson that I think would be good for uh, young entrepreneurs is be true to your word. If you're going to step out there and you're going to, uh, and you really believe in what, what you're doing, and you go out and you make a deal, stick with that deal. It, you may not think in the long run that that was the best deal for you, but if you go and try to shop the deal, 
then what happens is that you develop a reputation amongst investors and amongst your, your uh, other colleagues that you're untrustworthy. The only thing that you have as an entrepreneur that's going to allow you to get through those failures, and you're going to have a bunch of them, is your integrity. And in this case, I learned a lesson about integrity. And uh, I, I you know, use that lesson in, in every deal that I've done, that I've uh, been, been involved with going forward. I have to trust you as a, as a management team before I put money in. Okay, uh, thank you, Doctor. I think we've run out of time, uh, but it's been a wonderful experience. Please give a big round of applause to thank you. Dr. Harris. Thank you. thank you. If you'll just stay for a few more moments, uh, I request Pradeep Udas to present a memento to our guest, Dr. Harris. <laughs>